the idea is, is under like, underneath that is sort of to engage <laughs> together uh, to further explore and develop uh, what we've been presented with so far. So, beginning with uh, you and Matt's presentation and the uh, basically trying to get our thinking clear about what the situation we are in at the moment. It's quite easy to look back in history and see how it happened. It's another thing when you're in the middle of unfolding events to try and work out what's going on. And this very simple framework they've given us of the natural world, man-made economy, and the world of finance. And this very, very clear lesson of our continuing utter dependence on the natural world, despite all the uh, sophistication laid on it. And particularly, the need to be distinct about uh, energy and energy sources and the unique role that they, they play. And then just what we are thinking that, oh gosh, this is starting to looking a bit, um, things are happening here that we need to uh, give our attention to. What's to be done about it? Um, and rather than asking the qu question, what are they going to do about it? Uh, we've had John Michael's presentation really about asking us, what are we... <laughs> Um, because that's the, again, in terms of control and participation, that's the bit of the universe that we actually have uh, direct uh, control over. And then finally, very interestingly, uh, exploring, I think, the sense that um, Einstein's phrase, to get out of the problem, we need a different sort of thinking uh, to the thinking that got us into the problem. And with that different sort of thinking, the sense is also possibly a different mode of education. And I, again, another very helpful example that the way to explore uh, these new developments is not necessarily for you just to sit there and be told what the answers are, but there are more participative ways of, uh, of going about this process. So that's uh, on that foundation. Uh, we move on, this, and I'll over to you to ask what questions, what aspects you'd like the panel to develop further. And I think we'll allow if there are observations that you'd like to make at this stage, they would be welcome as long as uh, you get a sense of what the, the measure is. <clears throat> so um, it would be helpful if you could use the microphone as well so that uh, uh, <coughs> what you said is clear. You would like to yeah. start off? <clears throat> okay. Hello. Ah, good. Um, at lunchtime, mm -hmm. one of the things that came out of conversation was a sense that sometimes we don't have a real clear story of perhaps what the possible future could be. And I was reminded of Martin Luther King had a concept of beloved community, which he was aiming for. He may have been called naive at the time, but he said he needed something to aim for in order to communicate people on a journey. So what kind of story do you think we should be creating and sharing, and how should we frame that? I, um, I feel like I've had experiences in my life that have kind of given me that story. You know? So I've lived in communities, I've lived in places where I've been involved in transition town movement. And that sort of sense of uh, the fact that doing, making this change can actually be the most fun and interesting, beautiful thing to do. You know? So it's not because, because we care about climate change or because we're worried about the employers, it's just because I really enjoy doing these things with my friends and I enjoy, you know, whatever it is, cycling or tandem or picking stuff up in a trailer or doing apple pressing with a shared apple press and, you know, all of those things are actually incredibly enriching, lovely things to do. And I think, um, I, I did some woofing, I don't know if you've heard of that, um, he said sort of like willing workers on organic farms or worldwide opportunities on organic farms, they keep changing their name. But basically it's a, it's a kind of gift economy style of um, being able to work on farms and they're all ag um, organic and I did that when I was quite young I woofed around Canada and I woofed around the world and in, Canada, in Japan, Australia, New Zealand and had these experiences of living on farms and in, in all community and I think that gave me that vision and I think lots of people the kind of consumerist sort of society, urban society just literally don't have those experiences so um, I suppose I would encourage people to kind of do those things if possible. Um, but I also think we need more, more stories about it. The only one I can think of is 
book called The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk. It's the only novel I've read that seems to have a kind of positive vision of the future, which is also incredibly scary as well, because it's got the two sides of it. But if you're interested in a kind of actual novel about you know, that new vision. Ironically, I just published a science fiction novel. It's set 450 years in the future, post peak oil and everything else. The type of the stars reach. I don't know if that's the narrative you're looking for. These aren't the narratives you're looking for. <laughs> um, more generally, I don't think we need one narrative, and I think a focus on a, on finding a narrative that everyone will agree on is counterproductive at this time. I think we need many narratives. I know that the narrative, the, the narrative that I draw. From, from my spiritual roots, from the Druid tradition that I follow, um, is one that's very familiar to anyone who's seen the seasons of the temperate year. Winter is coming, but spring is coming behind it. I think, for me, um, it's clear that when, when we're creating narratives, uh, and particularly if we're wanting to lead changes in directions, we need to find a way uh, for, to inspire people. There needs to be something in it that, that really uh, strikes a chord in people's heart uh, in relation to these areas of, of these ultimate ends that people are looking for. Uh, I, I think that within the current economic climate, the, 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 the narrative is being hinged around having stuff and experiences. And um, what we need to do is find a way to, to turn that. And we need to find a way to reconnect people with inner development and inner growth. Um, Herman Daly talks about uh, growth as, as opposed to development. And he's, he says in a steady state economy, you can have a steady state of population and artifacts, so stuff, um, but you can have infinite development within it. And the vision of people developing their finest talents and um, the beauty of arts and the, the, the beauty of, of uh, uh, local communities and, and rebuilding relationships, um, I find quite an inspiring vision. But it, it, what we need to find is a narrative that uh, really speaks to people so that they can fall behind it. Yeah, I think um, there's an important point about the stories we tell, but ultimately, it's about finding our own stories. You know, essentially, I think the environments we face will be different for every single one of us. Um, but we've got to learn to find some of that personal meaning in a very different way. It's not about stuff out there. Um, it's more about being able to, I think, to take a, a metaphor from nature. You know, this idea of evolution um, that we sort of conflate with this idea of progress. In, in, in reality, it's not. Evolution is fitness, it's adapting to what's there. And I think partly that's a kind of a way of finding meaning, is to see where you are and become fit for it. Not just in terms of the external circumstance, but also your internal emotional circumstances too. And I think that's going to be as, as important part of this sort of development of one's own personal sort of story through life uh, as, as anything else. Um, I mean, I think we will eventually get some cultural stories which resonate across communities, but in the near future, I think we have to develop our own and, and learn to do that. Uh, it's one step at a time. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Well. Should be open. Yeah, I've, um, I've got two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, I really like the, um, the, the activity that Robin led um, before the break. Um, and obviously on the global board we have um, millions and millions of dots that could be a microsystem. But now, uh, since um, uh, the world's uh, problems become um, increasingly uh, complicated, and so do you, do you, does, does it mean that uh, the things are no longer cyclical? It's just a web of um, a lot of uh, different dots uh, interacting with each other. Okay, the second question is, um, given that uh, the dots interact with each other uh, at an at um, uh, unprecedentedly complicated rate, uh, what can be the new management model globally or uh, even inside a multinational company? Shall we just relocalize things? 
or uh, we focus on something else from the linkages between uh, the traditional sectors, or, or uh, are there any other uh, new management model that could be emerged? Well, management is a complicated situation when the thing you're trying to manage is already starting to fall apart. And one of the things that has very often gotten us into trouble in the recent past is the assumption that, it's, that we can come up with a model, we can apply it, and the world will follow suit. It doesn't always. I think that much of the management, already much of the management that's now going on is crisis management on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And as the fossil fuel surplus that has made possible this unprecedented level of interconnection goes away, so will a lot of the interconnections. Not in a simple, straightforward, linear fashion, but in unpredictable, uncontrolled, cascading patterns of breakdown. So um, relocalization does have huge advantages because it permits um, the equivalent of fireworks. <laughs> If you have a relocalized economic system, it's not going to be as thoroughly whipsawed by changes halfway around the world. But how soon people will be willing to accept this, knowing that relocalization always involves serious costs and a, declines, a reduced standard of living, is, again, it's very challenging. Because any management question is caught up in issues of politics, local, regional, national, and global. It's caught up in ecological, concerns, there are a lot of sources of chaos in the system. And so I think the management model that's likely to be de facto in place for some time to come is crisis management. Oh my god, what are we going to do now? Um, so. Um, I think one of the things that happens when there's a crisis is that people get fearful. And I think they what tends to happen is they do the opposite of what's needed, is that they try and structuralize things more. So when it seems, when people get scared, you know, in, in, in this current crisis, is they try and put in more procedures, more policies, you know, oh, this, this awful disaster happened, you know, like a child got, was um, killed, and so therefore we put all of these procedures and policies on social services. And, but actually I think what happens is that that makes it more likely that something else bad will happen. It's just that we can say, well, it wasn't my fault because I ticked all the boxes. <laughs> so I think there's a kind of, in, within this cultural narrative, it's counterintuitive, is that actually, as things start to fall apart, we need to, we need to let go of control more. And I think the trick that we need to learn is how to manage in uncertainty. Um, and, and one of the games that I sometimes do is one um, about failing with enthusiasm. So it's to do with, so we, we play um, hacky sack where you have to kind of keep a ball up in the air, which everybody is rubbish at doing. And the, the, actual, the actual rule is that you're not allowed to say sorry or make any derogatory noises about what you're doing. Um, and I think that's, you know, again, one of our culture's ideas that you've got, to be, you've got to do it right. And if not, then you should be sacked or you should be put in jail or you should be, you know. There's this kind of scapegoating thing going on. And just like there's a brilliant comment in the second group here when we were doing the, the game where you move, you're following two people, and he was saying, I wanted to blame people and say, stop moving, blaming these people. And everyone obviously is just following each other. So I think that it, it kind of, you realise how idiotic it is to blame in, individual people when you realise that everything is a complex inter, interacting system and that there's these much more complex reasons why people acted how they how they do. So but how do yeah. we participate in the complex systems that you talk about in your partner slides? Yeah, I mean I think um, for example when uh, when you say uh, when a child is ill in a very complex system, instead of uh, putting more procedures, procedures yeah. and procedures, then what else can, can we do what to prevent the, the child from getting ill again? I think I think it's to do with allowing the intelligence of the humans who are running that system to, to, to arise, to come out. So if you have a crisis like a child would die because of some um, bad process in childcare you know, or in social services, then I think there should be some process where social workers and teachers and police and parents come together and try and work out what happens, you know, how can we change things, what can we do, not have an auditing team who comes in and writes a report and points the fingers and says, this person should be sacked, and the, this policy should now be followed, and if you don't follow it, then 
you know, you, you, you'll be put in jail, you know, which is what ha is happens now. And that means that all of social workers are living in a kind of culture of fear now where they can't do their job properly. Um, so, yeah, I suppose to me it's to do with on, um, acknowledging the intelligence and the humanity of the people working in these organisations and allowing them to find the solutions together. May I, may I actually jump a second time? Um, Joseph Tainter, the author, author of The Collapse of Complex Societies, has discussed the fact that typically what happens in a complex society is that complexity becomes the main source of problems. But the only way anyone knows to, how to deal with it is to add more complexity. So that solutions become the major source of problems. And very often the fact that a child dies if you actually go through is because the system was too complex to allow it to live. But then we add another level of management, a level of complexity in there. The usual, the most effective solution to that, unfortunately, seems to be collapse, letting the system crash to the ground, and then putting to, and then trying to piece together something less complex to fill in its place. It might be possible to downsize the complexity in some less traumatic fashion, but as far as I know, nobody's actually managed that yet. So, um, just the buildup of excessive complexity be, and, and of attempts to manage. Sometimes the best way to manage is not to manage. Ultimately, this, this really seems to be related to the, what Donella Meadows was saying about mindsets and paradigms. You, you can play with all the lower elements of, of how the systems operate, and, and, but ultimately we have to change our mindset. Um, I, I don't think that really answers your question, but it, it's very important to, to come to a point where we completely change how we view the world and, and, and so this, this idea of management goes away perhaps or we're prepared to look freshly at, at the world and, and uh, consider new solutions. One, one more. <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 so what's interesting in the question is you say well what new management models can we bring but the concept of management itself might be the issue. You know what? What unmanagement models have we got? <laughs> you know, what management have you got? Yeah, <laughs> because um, a lot of what I've experienced certainly is that the process is about defining all these rules and formula, whereby that we can all go to sleep and it will take care of itself. No system does that. You know, it, it doesn't just run. You know, maybe the response is just that we all have to just wake up a bit. Use our intelligence. You know, but that's a very personal challenge. Um, just want to, you know, if you want to follow up, sorry, if you want to read up more about it, then, um, yeah, Danella Meadows certainly talks about this. Um, also, Margaret Wheatley has um, got many books about you know, taking ideas of complexity and systems thinking and putting them into organisational. And also, Peter Senge. Um, Next question is a gentleman by the window. Who's next? Thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, I read uh, John Michael's book, The Long Descent. And um, I think I'm understanding that we can't have endless growth and we're probably not going to get apocalypse next week or the week after. Um, I think his analysis showed that, that we, we will be on a, on a staircase where, where we have drops and treads and drops and treads. And it feels like we're kind of, after 2008, we're on the first tread. Um, mm -hmm. There's a slight upward feel to it that politicians will come and say, it's all getting better now, it's okay, we'll be all right, it's recovering. Um, and how do the panel feel about where we are in, in that process now? Are, are we ready for another drop yet? Or, or? I, 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 this, is a, this is a fairly common question. There, one of the things that I figured out since, the, um, since writing The Long Descent is that one very useful way to describe how civilizations decline and fall is that it's a fractal process so that you have little steps and big steps and really big steps. And um, there are also processes, there are decade, processes on a scale of decades, processes on a scale of a few years, and so on. Um, 
Yeah, the stair-step model remains my standard model, but it's important to look at the big picture also. In a very real sense, Western civilization hit its first downward step in 1914, with the beginning of the collapse of, Europe, of European global empire, a process which continued until the fall of Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Over that 40-year period, I'm sure some of you may be aware that life was a little rough in Britain and a number of other places. It wasn't all the same kind of rough. There's a lot of variation in space and time. But over that period, there was a lot of trouble. A lot of people lost their lives, there was a lot of economic devastation, and so on and so forth. A lot of stairs adding up to one big drop. My working hypothesis since, the, since I launched the blog was that we are heading into another such period. Just as the last period was mostly about who was going to take over after the British Empire fell over. This next one is about who gets to take over when the American Empire falls over, and having made all the same mistakes, slightly more stupidly. <laughs> okay. And um, you think we could have learned? You think we could have learned from you guys' experience? But quite the contrary. Um, so yes, when, exa when exactly historians will draw the beginning of this next round of crises is a heck of a good question. I don't know if we'll have a nice, clean assassination of an archduke or something like that to give us a convenient marker, or whether they'll just say, well, 2008 was the beginning, and then there was the war in Libya, the war in Syria, the war in Ukraine, the whole thing spinning out of control until finally whatever happened, ha happens, happens. Um, but yeah, one of the reasons that I keep on saying, you know, folks, we might want to look at doing things now and not necessarily continuing to talk endlessly, it's a very strong feeling that the time in which we will have the free, as much freedom to take action as we have now may be drawing very short. And that at any point within the next decade, we could see the first serious death throes of America's global empire with everything that that involves. Um, probably much of the impact of that is going to be right back home in America. And I'm expecting a very rough road there. But I doubt that Britain is going to stay out of the shrapnel range. So, how's that for a cheering? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. No. <laughs> You're brave. <laughs> I'm not adding, I'm going to predict when when it's going to happen and what's going to happen. Um, I'm still, it's still kind of forming in my mind what I think I'm actually saying here. Um, but it's something about needing some kind of damping, damping process. Because what I recognise in the current system is that there are incredibly strong self-regulating feedbacks in the economic system. And so even though everybody is talking about how idiotic the housing bubble was, um, and how desperate people are, how people can't get on the housing ladder and we need affordable housing and all of that. House prices in London are actually going up really quite quickly and people are talking about that as if that's a good thing on the news. It's like, what? You know, it's this completely schizophrenic thing where there's so much vested interest in house prices that continue to, to rise, even though people on one level know that it's a really disastrous thing. The people generally talking about it are the ones who actually have property and have a lot to lose if the house does go down in price. So, um, uh, and, and the other thing is that the economic system has this inherent, incredible instability in the sense that if people believe it's going to crash, it does. So it's this confidence game where even if, even if one, you know, respected economist stood up, stood up and said, "Get your money out of oil," because tomorrow, you know, soon, then it would, you know, the next day, it could do. Um, and so there's this kind of really strange conference game, and I'm just wondering if, if there's any way for us to not have this terrible crash, that we need to design some kind of damping process that takes that, that stops those kind of incredibly strong, um, sort of, yeah, <coughs> negative feedback uh, system, but I'm not quite sure what, what that is. Right. <laughs> Probably, I'll think about it more, I may not come up. So. I think the one thing I'd add is, 
um, you know, one thing Denial Meadows said is the one thing that this system does is try and grow. And what that means is it's not some abstract things. We're, we're the system. So when, when there are these stutters, we all start behaving differently to try and prevent that, almost to restabilize the system in the direction it was going. And I think the, it will become more and more difficult to read anything out of the financial response because it's such a complicated and chaotic system. It's very volatile. But secondly, there's loads and loads of interest within the system, vested or otherwise, and we're all vested in it. If you've got a pension, you're vested. You know, for it to carry on. So we pump it full of debt, we start printing money. And let's all just agree not to ask the question of where's it all coming from. Because if we ask that question, it's got a very difficult answer. But, you know, we're all complicit in that. We all want, no one here wants to see it fail. Really, no one does. And that's the kind of interesting sort of psychological situation, community psychological situation that comes out of this. So the responses are going to be very yeah, unpredictable, I think, because people aren't going to sit on their hands and just let it all fall over. We're all going to be madly trying to do stuff to make sure that it doesn't. And in doing so, we kind of, in a sense, per per perpetuate its, it's decline, <laughs> um, which is, the, the, I think, the funny situation. It's non-linear, completely non-linear. I've thought of what those damping things are. <laughs> um, and, you know, well, neatly, they're what John Michael's talking about, what the Transition Towns movement is talking about. And basically, creating community resilience does that damping thing, doesn't it? Because if, you know, if I invest, say if I've got some money, instead of having it all in property, if I invest it in a local um, community support agriculture scheme and a, and a community orchard, for instance, I'm going to be much less worried about my money going because I know that I've got something real, which is food for the next 20 years or whatever. Um, and yeah, so and I think that's um, yeah, of course. Um, I'd like to I'd like to interject something. Um, one of the things about de about disintermediating your your own economic life, getting as much as possible out of the financial economy, is that at this point the financial economy is the source of the instabilities. The financial economy was suppo is supposed to be, ask your local um, orthodox economist, is supposed to be a source of stability and strength and store of value. Crap. <laughs> it's not. At this point it's the main generator of economic instability because it's designed to work in a growing economy. We don't have one of those anymore. It got lost behind the sofa. And so, it's generating the crises to the extent that you can back away from it. No. Okay, boy. Calm down. And to the extent that you can back away from it, toss it a puppy biscuit or something, you will be better off. Because the less impact it has on you personally, the less freaked out you're going to be, the less your own lives the lives of your, of your household, the lives of your community, and so on, are going to be influenced. And there may be a critical mass effect at which enough people in a given area have enough space from the financial economy that, some, that a little more stability can enter the picture. I don't know. It would take some very complex system modeling, or more likely, enough people giving it a try to determine that one way or the other. Um, with regard to volatility, though, um, I know we've got, the ho you've got the housing bubble going here in London again. You also, um, your government is currently trying to import the largest, spe the current big speculative bubble from America. That's called fracking. Okay? Yeah. It is a fraud. Seriously. What they've done is drill a handful of sweet spots in a handful of shale oil reservoirs, used that production to insist, we can get this kind of thing from all the reservoirs and all the well sites. It's not true. We just had a situation where um, the, the US agency response, the federal agency responsible for um, handing out claims of how much oil is where, had to admit that they had overestimated the amount of oil in the Monterey Shale, which was supposed to be 64% of America's frackable oil by 96%. <laughs> Oops. That's, those same analyses have not yet been applied to the rest of the frackable oil reserves. 
the whole, that right now the only way the U.S. economy works at all is when there's a speculative bubble going on. Because if you don't have a bubble booming, the economy's in the tank. Okay. So the next time um, one of your politicians starts frothing at the mouth about the wonders, the, the wonderful future um, that Britain's going to have once it, it drills fracking wells all over the place and ruins its aquifers for hundreds of years in the future, and all these kind of little things, be aware you are being sold. Uh, you're, you're being sold the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, it is. It's completely fraudulent. And it's simply an attempt to bring in bubble economics to prop up a failing economic model. Um, do you have this in mind? Tell your friends. And if you have anything invested in a, frac in a fracking related company, get that money out soon because when it goes, well, maybe lighter here, when it goes in America, there's going to be an economic crash of, of 2008 scale. We're fairly close to that. And I would not be surprised if it happens later this year. We'll see. At any rate, this announcement brought to you. <laughs> and after that little aside, the next question. Uh, Leonie? Um, well, I'm not sure if I should bring this up, but we have been boring on for many years in this school about land value tax and the law of rent. And there has been a lot of talk about energy and um, other things today, but not anything about the nature of the finite land mass and mm -hmm. resources, of course, we talked about all of it. I just wondered if you thought that there was anything useful there. I'll maybe start with that, because um, I think I don't really agree. Um, I think that uh, the work's been done here, particularly around looking at land um, and, and, and taxation, is really an example of, of, of what we call that common, the common wealth which comes from nature. Um, I mean, it's more complicated because actually all of those economies we've talked about, whether it's those social processes or the, you know, the actual natural resources or the way we organise our, our economies here, there are elements of commons all the way through that. So, you know, the idea of land value taxation really being based around the fact that you know, a plot of land out here or down in Mayfair is worth a huge amount, huge amount of money. Uh, if you want to put a shop on it, you can rent that out to someone who will pay you a lot. How much do you think they pay on Oxford Street for a shop on Oxford Street? But the value of being on Oxford Street is because there are tube lines there, there are bus routes there, the whole of London City is around it, and people live here. We all, well, a lot of us live there. That's where the value came. If you took that shop and put it in the, the back end of Scotland, you're not going to be able to get much of a rent out of that. Economic rent, really. So I don't see any real difference in, in what's being spoken about, in, in understanding what is the natural commons and how, um, if we didn't talk too much about it in the financial system, maybe you can say a couple of words on that, but there's, it, essentially the way it's set up is that there is this constant funnel into this asset-based economy which inflates the value of things. But as Donella Meadows points out, what we've actually got is a success to the successful loop. In, in systems terms, <coughs> so that people who are successful are way more likely to be more successful. And, and that's what a sort of a, um, a sort of speculative asset-based economy, which is essentially what we've ended up with there, has resulted in. So the idea of land value taxation from a systems perspective, like Robin said, is, is, is really a way of looking at how you put a damping function within what is essentially a, a, a vicious spiral, one that continues to grow. The more it grows, the more it grows. I don't think it could um, help produce a, a virtuous spiral. Um, so these spirals can, can be turned both ways, but what you want is really you want something that's a bit stable. Um, the challenge we have is is that the people, oh, you know, if, if if you have or you're in in receipt of a load of rents off, say, most of Oxford Street, like due for Westminster um, or Mayfair, then you know you've got a vested interest in not changing the system too much. Unfortunately, you can afford to lobby and make sure that that's not too easy. And that, that's just actually just a feature of a success the successful loop. It's part of its mechanism. So one of the things that I think is really, really important that Donella Meadows points out is that you can't blame individual people for this. Everyone in the system behaves rationally given their individual perspective within it. 
What you have to look is the mindset which generated that system in, in the first place. Uh, and that's a challenge. So, you know, the old saying that, you know, the politicians in Westminster are the office boys of government. What it begs is the question, where is real government happening? What really governs the way we behave and what we do? Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that question really comes back to this fundamental perspective of mindset, what is just? Which is, I think, why, the, you know, the economics here is titled Economics with Justice, because you can't separate these two things. You can't separate the mindset from the behaviour. Um, so, yeah, I don't disagree with you covering it. Do you want to add anything? I, I think Matthew's probably said everything that I would say, so... I'm going to have to listen to me for much longer. Um, that was me at first. <laughs> the economic rent of land is, is just an example of a rent which flows through the economy. And there are other rents. There are rents of money. There are natural resource rents, all of which have the same effect in the economy. So if we look at that circular flow of money that, we're, that we touched on very briefly, um, if those economic rents are unattenuated and are privatised, it creates this feedback loop that Matthew talks about. So I think any economic system that wishes to remain stable has to address that point. But fundamentally, we also have to address the, the, the issue of, of how we um, pr produce a, a, a money supply for the economy. Um, because that seems to have very direct implications on um, the economy needing growth. Uh, I think that there is also potentially a temptation to see these things as a, as, as a magic bullet. That, you know, th this is the thing which will solve all of the problems. Uh, and I think I'd be reluctant to go down that route. I, I, my sense is, and particularly after reading more, more Herman Daly, is that there needs to be, you can't let everything be... Um, dictated by the market. The market won't effectively discriminate between using a resource today and saving it for 200 years time for, for future generations. And therefore, the, we have to look at the institutional frameworks that we have to, to question how, how we go about managing those commons, how, how we go about making sure that, that those commons are distributed fairly, not just amongst the current the living generations, but future generations as well. We didn't have time to get to this in the, in the conversation, but one of the things in my book, The Wealth of Nature, is a discussion of the fact that, by and large, modern, industri modern industrial societies tax the wrong thing. We tax productive work. We tax wages, we tax salaries, things like that. And then we give, we may tax money um, made by money. Money rent, if I'm using the term, for the, the your term correctly, but the, the tertiary, we don't, we, we give the tertiary economy all kinds of breaks because it's supposedly productive, and we don't pay any attention to the drawdown of the primary economy. One of the suggestions that I threw out in the book, precisely, mostly to throw a cat among the pigeons, was a suggestion of a completely new tax regime where salaries, wages, and other, the other income from productive economic activity pays no taxes. That all taxes are either on the use of natural resources such as land, such as mines, such as wells, it's such as the atmosphere. If you're going to use the atmosphere as a garbage can for your, tail, for your exhaust, you need to pay rent for that. Rent to the holder of the commons, which would be the government on some level. And the other is, of course, paying rent on the ma money making money. Because the, play the reason the tertiary economy runs out of control is that Money making money becomes a vicious spiral, and you end up with this, this growth of the money supply out of control, which ends either in hyperinflation, in um, credit collapse and default, or in an endless number of uh, postponement mechanisms or exercises that we're currently engaged in, ending in one or the other, or both. So, by taxing interest, by taxing um, all income from paper assets, rather than by taxing, say, laborers' salaries and more wages. That way you actually have a damper on those aspects of the situation that tend to run out of control. And the idea of, of a tax on land rent is very appropriate to that. It would be a, very, a good step in that direction. I would like to encourage people of the school to think about applying that same logic to all natural resources, which are part of the commons of the nation ultimately of the world. And 
when they are used for private purposes, the pri um, as as, El as Eleanor Ostro pointed out in, in re her research, which won a Nobel Prize, if the, uh, if the resources of a commons are used for private benefit, the way to regulate that commons is to make sure that the people who are using it chip in, you know, tribute that can then be distributed. So um, I think the same that print the principle of the la of the land rent tax could be applied more broadly. And then there's also the issue of effectively a money rent tax, again. Same logic, slightly more broader, more systemic application, I think could be a very viable system. Now, is it going to be put in place under the current system with the current si Probably not. Is the current system glued in place forever? Most nations in the world have had a complete change in their method of government within the last century. Britain and the United States are among the very few that haven't. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Don't know about Britain, but I have I have a real strong hunch about the United States. Mr. <laughs> Judgment <laughs> his. I think I'm going to get into trouble here because uh, you've asked for us to suggest things for us to do, and I think I've ended up suggesting things lots of other people can do. <laughs> but, but I'll go with it anyway. Um, if we go back to 2012, the uh, the global campers outside St. Paul's were criticized for a number of things, one of them that they had incoherent messages. Um, I've got a fairly crude comment on that, which, which is that if we'd spent what well, we spent on the Iraq war on developing a new system of economic and political uh, progress, which was sound, we'd probably have gotten on that by now. But, I mean, my broad perspective is that in a somewhat free society, failing the sort of meltdown that Michael and others have been pointing to, things only really happen when there is a popular consensus and a political will, and actually not otherwise. And I suggest that's kind of why we are where we are today. Um, I think the most important thing is slightly off our current subject, which is to convey an honest appraisal of where we are at to the wider public. And so far, the wider we and the media have completely failed with that in the, in the US and the UK. Um, I've got a relatively uninformed position, but in that connection, I think that maybe the SES hides its light under a bushel, because I, I think personally you have a lot of very interesting and, and useful and practical economic ideas. Um, but I ask myself, uh, you know, where are the representatives from ABAS or from The Economist or for the Financial Times on your courses or indeed in, in this room? So I think if we can spread the word to a few hearts and minds, that could just help. Maybe just a response to that. I mean, um, a few years ago, I was on my local parish council. I've maybe told this story before, but I learned a really, really important lesson there. Um, we were doing this huge building program, and um, every year we used to go through the procedure and elect new members of the council. You're on for a three-year period. And probably the most influential guy on the parish council was never elected on. Every year we elected everyone, the first thing we did was co-opt this guy. He was the treasurer. Uh, you know, he just knew everything. And I remember, you know, we're going, I've been sort of reviewing all this stuff about this building program. And I, I went to him and said, look, we need to, you know, we should be thinking about doing this, 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 and this. And he, I could just tell he didn't kind of agree with me. But he said, no, oh, he said, that's a great idea, Matt. I was a bit surprised. He says, why didn't you go and do it? Ah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, you know, if I take another evening out, my wife's going to divorce me. You know? <laughs> and um, you kind of suddenly realise the, the power of being able to just make a contribution in some way. And you know, the, the dedication of your own time, not your thinking, but your time, actually doing something, is, in, is massively disproportional from thinking about something. So there is this question really, what can we do? What can we do? Hugh and I put our, stuck our flag up a pole about a year ago, and said, look, we'll do this. And Peter said, yeah, you can do the conference in summer 2014. Okay. And then we found out what that meant. You know. <laughs> and really, this is a product. You know, this is our first step. Um, 
you know, this organisation here is interesting. It's been going for 70 years. And as you say, it's very varied. Um, you know, economics is where it started, and it defined economics as the relationship between human beings and society. And about 20 years into that, it sort of came up with this question, well, actually, how can you understand what they are unless you understand human beings? And they started this little side group on philosophy, which is now bigger than the economics. Or about the same sort of size. Um, and that's, just, that's an interesting fact, that a lot of things came out of that. Um, so we run this big arts event in the summer called Art in Action, which is, I think, the largest arts and crafts fair in the whole of Europe. And the only reason we can do that is because we're a voluntary organisation. If you ran it commercially, you could never run it. And we face the same challenges. Is every year, it's harder and harder to get people to volunteer at the time. Now, I spent 20 years, 20 years, running the car parks with some friends of mine. That's what we did. I'll be on the car parks this year. Um, 10th of July, by the way. But the principles of art in action, which we hold up in Oxford, is that people can only demonstrate... Uh, well, it's called, they're called demonstrators. They can only have a, a pitch there if they're actually practicing what they do. And people like you can come and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Handcrafts. Um, and in, a, in many ways, it started from a group of people who are interested in art. No, not really related. But in this context, what we're talking about is massively relevant. Because it's about that skill, hand skill, bringing these people together who often never met each other and creating those communities. Um, you know, we talk about the sort of sense of, well, that consequences of rethinking your own personal journey. And actually, the philosophy course has, has something to say there. So we've kind of got this weird kind of mix of all these different things. Um, and to me, it feels, actually, there's a lot we can offer here. But, as I say, it's a voluntary organisation. There's a two, four, five people that we actually employ, and they run the office. Everything else, all those people who serve you tea today, volunteers. And the beauty of that is we're quite insulated, well, to some extent, insulated from the finance economy, um, more than we would otherwise be. And we still have to pay the bills. Um, and, you know, the fees you pay today are designed to cover the cost of that. That's all. I just wanted to pick up on the, the Occupy movement because, um, and what you said about it, because I just found that a very inspiring thing that happened in process actually. And I thought what you said about it, that, that the media were basically saying that there's this incoherent message you know, from them, it's sort of frustrating. That to me demonstrated the exact problem that, they, that the Occupy movement was flagging up, is that there's this idea that there should be a coherent message when, when we're talking about an incredibly complex thing, you know, this idea that, well, you shouldn't do anything until you've got the solutions that are demonstrated to work, you know. <laughs> Actually, it's almost the other way around. It's that we just need to do something and see what happens. And, and like we, we saw in the, the game, you know, you, you have to go through a process of chaos to find the solution. And if you don't go through that process of chaos, you literally cannot get there. There isn't, there isn't a way of getting straight to the final solution. And if you do, it probably is a kind of sham solution that will end up causing more problems. Um, and I thought that reminded me of something that Martin Shaw, who's an uh, incredible storyteller, um, uh, based, is he down in Devon? Or is he, yeah, he's based down in Devon. Um, but the, he runs uh, a thing called, it's like a solo or a vision quest where you actually go off on your own for a day or a week, for instance, in, in nature. And the, the key thing is that you don't tell that story of what happened for the time that you were away for. So you wait for another whole day until you tell your story, or you wait for another whole week if you were away for a week until you tell your story. And the kind of you know, rationale behind that is that when you tell a story, you linearize it. You, 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 lay, you have to lay it down into a linear um, set sentence. Um, but before you say that, it still is in your mind as a holistic something. And so you can kind of see that incoherence, say, in the, as the Occupy movement has that way of holding a kind of holistic way of dealing with a very complex issue. And if you try and crystallise it into some sound bites that will fit on the Today programme or whatever, you, you never really get it, you know? That isn't actually it if you, if you try and crystallise it. 
So, and I think that is utterly unrecognised, basically, in this culture, that, that idea of the benefit of having things left uncrystallised for a bit until, until, you, until, in a way, they emerge. You know? And I think that's a kind of more intuitive, that's what people might mean when they talk about intuition, you know, letting your mind work in a holistic way, and then the intuitive insight is the thing that, where it crystallises a bit. It kind of does it itself, it emerges by itself, not through a rationalisation process. Question, Mr. You, you had your hand up last time. You'd like to ask, yeah. There's been a sort of tension in, in everything that's been said today between um, kind of crawling back from the precipice or just embracing the chaos and going with it. I mean, to what extent does the panel think that either of those is sort of preferable or obviously the precipice is very scary, but if we, if we pull back from it, then are we in danger of just keeping the same problems that we always had? I'll have a first go. <laughs> um, I suppose, really, the, the implications is that there is no real choice of pulling back. Uh, I think it's a question of the grace over we, uh, with which we go over it. Um, and I think the second aspect to it is, is really a question of, is it really a precipice? I you know, I think, referring to Joseph Tainter, I think he talked about the, the collapse of the Lowland Maillard, which is held up as this classic of, you know, complete societal collapse. But uh, if you look at the, the actual time scale, the, the, if, if you've been someone who was there at the peak of that civilization, and you took to the point that it took for the last person to walk out of that village and abandon or that city and abandon it to jungle, seven generations. So if you lived through it, it wouldn't feel like that at all. It doesn't feel like a precipice. It feels like a long st st slope full of stones that you bounce down over a long period of time. <laughs> If it's a precipice, we've already gone over the brink. The question is navigating the slope. Um, if something is not sustainable, it's a pretty safe bet that it can't be sustained. So it's not a matter of, of maintaining the problems that we've got. Those are already um, spiraling out of control and we'll do the usual um, positive feedback thing until they um, spin up and do whatever. It's purely a matter of navigating the way down, seeing what that we have that we can preserve, we might want to preserve. What that we have that we don't want to preserve, we can effectively get rid of. And how to maneuver as the boulders crash around us and the landslide continues, so that we, so that as few of us as possible, few of the people we care about as possible, get squashed. One of the things about the fall of the, of the Lowland Maya is that it was a rolling collapse that hit in different places at different times. Rather like the situation now, there were some city-states that were bankrupt and failing, while others were doing more or less okay. And even after almost everything else was, was gone, Copan was still around for an extra, for an extra century. And then up in the, in the northern end of the Yucatan Peninsula, things continued for centuries after that. It's, it's easy to see it as the precipice, the collapse. But as I mentioned, we've actually been in this decline since 1914. Um, we have been through, we went through a steep drop, a leveling out, um, in many ways in terms of standards of living, a leveling out with a lot of fancy toys, but not much more than leveling out. The next decline begins, okay. This is a familiar thing. If you, if you read history, you will find this kind of experience is very common. And I would encourage you to keep that in mind, because we can make it look really big and scary, like a precipice that we could fall over, when in fact, it's just the trail down from the summit. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, it strikes me that this is about the emotional response. So the, the, the question really is, is, what makes us describe it as a pre precipice? Is it something that's really scary? Or can we change our viewpoint? Can we embrace it? Can we look at it and say, hey, this is great, this is an opportunity. I'm only working three days a week. What else did I do? <laughs> I think most of us would, 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 would rejoice at that. There may be other problems that come with it. How am I going to pay my mortgage? Well, nobody else on the street can anyway, so we're all in it together. And, and uh, I think that the mind tends to try and find um, 
paralyzing narratives, particularly in, in this area. And you know, this is something that Matthew and I have traveled with for a few years now. And I've, I've had sleepless nights after reading some books because my heart's been beating so hard because I'm just looking at it and going, oh my God, we're all doomed. And I hope not mine. No, 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 he is good. Uh, but but it, it really comes down to ha what our perspective is and, and how we view it. And if we can find, and this, this is why it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, about this, this need for a, for a compelling vision uh, and the need to find a narrative which makes sense and, and which we can embrace. And you can, there's all sorts of things you can choose to love if you, if you put your mind to it. Uh, yeah, and just almost adding to Hugh's point. Um, I, I, I sort of think that uh, one of the lovely things about the transition to Hamlet movement, which is just my sort of experience of this process, um, is that you can sort of see that uh, there's three things. So there's stopping causing the ecological or financial problem in the first place. There's being resilient, so dealing, being able to survive the effects of that climate change, for instance, or the uh, financial crash. And there's what I love doing, you know, what I enjoy, what gives me joy in my life. And I think that you, if you can find that sweet spot where you, you get all three of those, do that. And I think actually you can, you know, like for instance, cycling, for instance, is, is one of mine. That I just do love it, it makes me feel better, I enjoy it. It is also stopping climate change because I'm not emitting CO2, but it also is making me more resilient because I know I can get all around London without any fossil fuels, which is brilliant to know that, you know, know all of the routes already, for instance. So that's the kind of example. And I just quite often do an exercise, especially with young people, getting them to write a list of what they love doing, what they, you know, what they think is important to changing the, the world, um, and uh, what they are good at, you know and sort of seeing where, where those things link up. And I think start off doing that, and I think once you get involved in that, you start realizing that there's loads of those things, and the things that you didn't realize you actually love doing, like, I don't know, um, like growing food. You, you might think that sounds like a right, you know, boring thing to do. And then actually when you do it, you find it's incredibly rewarding, for instance. Um, so I think uh, start off with those things where you get the sort of triple win, and then you might actually find that there's lots more triple wins that you haven't really re realised were that. I think the Swayne had a question. There's probably maybe that, um, one more question. Mm -hmm. I actually don't like speaking, because nobody can hear me anyway. <laughs> um, but I have to say oh, something. Is it like, is it like, no, it's only like, you have to point it to yourself in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't like speaking because nobody can ever hear me. You can now. <laughs> but I have to um, have to try because of the um, men mentioning of Occupy and fracking. Um, because, um, I mean, that Occupy has changed my life since 2011. Um, it hasn't gone away, it still exists. It's, it's, a lot of your presentations actually describes Occupy, you know, the way you go into chaos and then you spin out and different things. That, so it's a sort of a work in progress, I think, of, of um, you know, the things that you describe in sort of intellectually. That's a, you know, um, there are about 12 different groups. Um, I, I, my group, the group I'm most involved in is the economy group. Um, but there's environmental groups, democracy groups, and there's about 12 different groups who sort of meet up. And then they meet maybe twice a week, uh, sort of different venues. So it's sort of, it's learning, expanding, evolving all the time, and it's still where my hope is. And uh, with the, fr I mean, fracking, I came into from Occupy, which I wasn't really ready to do yet. <laughs> But when Borkham happened, uh, that was near enough for me to get on a train and go and have a look at it. So, uh, and it's absolutely amazing. Uh, so my recommendation to anybody is, if you're lucky enough to have 
Uh, and we are expecting drillers to be on site this year um, in goodness knows how many different places. All the all the laws are now in place so that they're ready to go and the tax breaks are all there and the permissions to drill underneath your or everybody's properties. Everything is now in place. Um, and you know, Osborne, Michael Fallon, and, you know, they're all wanting to go as soon as possible. So my expectation is we'll be drilling this year. Um, so if you're lucky enough to have a drilling site near enough, then you'll be lucky enough to have a camp near enough. So if a camp, uh, if you get a camp, go and visit it. Um, you know, if it's near enough to go, if it's near enough to commute, to commute, um, because then you see, you know, I mean, you see, it's an example of you know, people who are. There are skilled people, there are people who are learning, people who didn't know anything. Um, so it's a, a community that develops sort of quickly. <laughs> um, but it's just very interesting. And if you have a, a and yeah, um, and if you have a and if you have a dash for gas camp, which is a sort of a small a smaller period of time. Um, with uh, dedicated people, you know, dedicated people, they're very skilled, um, you know. But but I mean, I'm, I was naturally uh, cautious of things, getting involved with things. But once we occupied, um, and because it was tents at St Paul's, um, once you've crossed the boundary, you know, it's so it's so <coughs> fascinating, and you learn so much, and you do meet skilled people. And uh, yeah, so anyway, but the fracking one, yes, I, mean, I would expect there will be camps this year, and I would just say, don't you know, I'm, I was cautious, but it's just so interesting. It's what you said about harnessing excitement. So if you want to harness excitement, um, commute to camps when, when they appear. I would strongly encourage anybody to support um, anti-fracking protests and all activities of that kind. It, the bubble doesn't have that much longer to go. When it pops, a large number of the companies involved are, are effectively insolvent already. They are making much less money than they are than they're than they're spending. They're covering the distance by borrowing on short-term loans at high interest rates. It's a world-class financial mess waiting to happen, and if you can just throw enough monkey wrenches into it, you can probably get by without too many wells being drilled. Um, in the United States, where we have um, a rather more confusing and confused system of governance, there are states that have been fracked like a fairly well. There are others that have managed to tie it up completely. I don't know what your options are. You've got a different legal system, different governmental system, but do what you can. Anything you can do to slow it down May leave, say, may leave places unfracked, water tables unpoisoned, and so on and so forth. This is really a time for an all-out push. Can I, can I just say that the, uh, borrowing the money, I mean, it's all the financial institutions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. These bits of paper are on their assets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually they're worthless. So when it's become, when it's somehow or other, it's obvious that mm -hmm. they're worthless, so they become liabilities. Do you, do you remember when um, bundled mortgages oh, yeah. by um, people who oh. never had a chance of paying their mortgages were being loaded onto the asset? The same thing is being done at this point, bundled shale leases. They're all over the place. And I, I am assuming that those leases have already been cut here, bundled and sold to suckers who will end up holding the bag. That's how the industry works these days. Um, work the toilet paper it's printed on. And yeah, it's, I, I'm really expecting another 2008 style crisis and it could land as soon as the second half of this year. So, assume crash positions. <laughs> I was hoping that we could go out on a... On a <laughs> <laughs> I'm good that way. <laughs> but I'm afraid that the, we got to the point where the time has, has run out. I think we could go on uh, all evening, but um, I think we should draw things to a, a close now.
Uh, if, you, if you want a desperate burning uh, issue yes, to, just yes. add. Oh, well, the, the most positive thing I got out yeah. of the day, um, I just wanted to, you know, have a yeah. to finish on a, a good Thank you. note. Um, when, when Robin did the, um, you know, the, the game where you, it's chaos and then it stabilizes and so on, and you said that this is not just a model of the climate, it's also a model of the solutions that out of nowhere, out of chaos, uh, solutions, if that's the right word, but, you know, good things happen as well. Yeah. The important thing is we've got to connect those up so that we all begin to disseminate information. Yeah. Well, thank you. For that. Yes, I think that's a very appropriate uh, sort of concluding remark. I, I suppose I could go for the, the linear approach and go through the day and the propositions <laughs> and the discussions and now feel there's got to be a conclusion. I think I'll avoid that and just look at the whole the day from the system's point of view and just think what remarkable things human beings are and what amazing things happen when like-minded people come together uh, and just to have a view of what, what has emerged out of it. And I'm sure that for everyone here something useful and worthwhile has emerged and even the possibility of actually going away and from this day on starting leading your life in a slightly different way. Just making that first step. It doesn't have to be a big one but there have been plenty of suggestions, possibilities, just to think, well, actually, the main thing to take from this day is, yep, let's not just think about it, but just take that first step to actually starting to live in a different way. I think there's some, uh, just finished by um, expressing some thanks and, and gratitude. Uh, firstly to uh, Hugh and Matt, who, you know, it's one thing to have a good idea, and that's good. It's another thing to study a subject and make sense of it. But to actually take it through to develop your ideas so you can produce a, a coherent course that people are actually prepared to pay money to come along and, and listen to and appreciate and put it all together. And then to be able to summarize the whole thing in, in one hour, I think, I think is um, a tremendous achievement. So I just sort of big round, big. Uh, And again, a very big vote of thanks to uh, John Michael and Chris. Robin, sorry. I've <laughs> <laughs> spent so many times asking people their name, I can remember yeah. Peter, for coming along and their unique contributions. I mean, did you use some carbon dioxide? Did you use some carbon dioxide coming over? Um, yes, my, my carbon dioxide set aside is that I've never owned a car. Oh, right, okay. So I think, I think it was worth it. I, uh, and for their unique contributions, it's really made, filled out the day and, uh, and made a rather special occasion. Thank you. Thank you. And, and finally, um, weren't those amoeba great, the way they all came together, self-assembled into this vehicle that could move? If only human beings could reach that level of sophistication. And it would be great to think an occasion like this could just sort of happen spontaneously. Uh, our experience is that if it, it doesn't quite happen like that, and there actually needs to be somebody behind the scenes doing a lot of work, getting the message out, getting the organisation done, uh, looking after the catering, so that on the day it appears if it's sort of all just happened spontaneously, but I'm sure there's a lot of work has gone into this event to getting it together, organising it, and make, made it go in the, the fluid way that it has. So, great thanks is it here to, he's hiding behind the corner to uh, Pisa and his wife Jill, who put in uh, for all the work they've done in making the day so <laughs> To mention our uh, men on the, the technology. Just, uh, again, thank you very much. We're looking forward to the day when all the energy is gone and we have scribes <laughs> writing down the event. But uh, for the moment, thank you very much for your contribution. And finally, thank you all for, for coming along, for your the fullness of the spirit in which you've contributed. We are very interested in how you found the, found the day, so 
Uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you could just write down your the comments and uh, your views of the day um, and leave them with us. Um, and let's wait to see what happens next. The future is about to happen and it's here with us now. So again, thank, thank you. you all for your participation. Thank you.